Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we're talking today about Ezekiel chapter 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. I feel a song coming on, yeah. (laughs) And of course... Moses Hogan descends from the ceiling. Yeah, (laughs) out of nowhere. (laughs) Everyone knows this chapter, if you are at all familiar with Black Spirituals. I will not sing it, but something about them bones, them bones, and dry bones. Oh, hear the word of the Lord. It's really in the Bible, and it sounds exactly what you, you would think like. There are these bones, and they're in a valley, and the bones are very dry. Not just kind of dry. Not kind of dry. sometimes are. Mm-hmm. These are really dry bones. So that makes them all the more difficult to speak life into, right? <laughs> right? Because moist bones are most, easier well, to most, bring Most to bones life. come back to life so much more easily. <laughs> yeah. God, God does have a sense of, of humor and of irony. And sometimes mm-hmm. he does put in things like this just to say, yeah, it, it doesn't matter, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> just just to uh, grab your attention. Well, let me read a little bit of it, and then and we can talk about it. This is chapter 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Always a safe answer when you're talking to God. (laughs) (laughs) Again, he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And we, we can stop there for a moment because most of what we need to talk about is wrapped up there. I I doubt that any of us has gone out into a cemetery and tried to have a conversation with all the dead people buried there. Sometimes you'll see people kneeling at a grave, and if you draw close, you'll hear them talking to their dear beloved Aunt Tessie or whatever. But I think they understand that, or they think that somehow... The gravesite is sort of a, a cell phone to heaven because Grand Aunt Tessie, of course, is not physically in the ground. She's gone on to heaven to glory to whatever. So question. So, yeah. Whenever you talk about a departed loved one, yeah. it's always Great Aunt Tessie. Of course. Is that a conscious choice? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> okay. Because I don't know anybody who has a Great Aunt Tessie. It's just okay. safer that way. <laughs> Well, there we go. Today, I was looking around. I wanted to use a random girl's name as an example in my class. It took me a long time to find a girl's name that was not represented <laughs> in my class. I think I ended up with Cindy. Cindy I do know some Cindy's, solid. but not so do I. Not in my <laughs> class. So, you know, I used to use, I use Ned now for guys' names because mm. I don't know any Neds. Mm-hmm. I, I tried, I think I tried Ed and Ted and then, oh, uh, my, my dad's name that. Okay, I can't use that anymore. <laughs> so, you know. So Tess, uh, you're, you're you're talking to Great Aunt Tessie, I, but I don't think any of those people actually think that the grave's going to open and Great Aunt mm-hmm. Tessie's going to step up, either as a skeleton, a zombie, a living corpse, or a resurrected person. It's just this thing we do because it sentimentally it makes us feel better. I think we all understand that when you put the body in the tomb, it's dead and it's not coming back anytime soon, that it would in fact take an act of God in the most literal sense to mm-hmm. to bring that person back to life in any form, whatever. Well, I mean, that's represented in the phrase, you know, it's dead and buried. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. it is well and truly put to rest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or as my girls would say, it's dead, D-E-D, dead. <laughs> yes. I know they CRT, that from- <laughs> dead right there. <laughs> Get right there. Um, and and this is the image that God uses, in this case, to represent Israel in her uh, spiritual depravity, her spiritual mm-hmm. covenantal death, 
and and one that the whole Bible uses. You could think of Paul, but you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And perhaps we'll come back to to some such phrases later. But it's it's a common enough idea. Sin is death. Salvation is life. To pass from death to life is to be born again, to be regenerated, to be saved in that specific sense of the word. And so God shows these bones and says, can these bones, these bones that represent Israel, can can they live? Well, the, the, the proper answer where things divine are concerned probably is, well, Lord, it depends, doesn't it? <laughs> um, not normally, not in the normal flow of uh, your providence, they don't. As you say, it's dead and buried. It's not coming back. But Lord, you're God, and you can do anything. They could live if you wanted them to. And so the Lord says, prophesy to the bones. And there's Ezekiel on this mass. It's not exactly a graveyard because the bones aren't buried, but a mass, perhaps battlefield, someplace where there's a lot, an awful lot, many, many unburied, dry, very dry bones. And Ezekiel gets to, to prophesy, to preach to them. I suppose for a people of great faith or people who've seen lots of miracles, this might not seem like much of a challenge. Well, God said it. What's the big deal? God, God tells his servants to do lots of things. You know, marry a <laughs> prostitute, walk around naked, eat dung. You know, or actually, it was eat food baked over dung, but you know, confuse that sometimes. Um, still gross. Yeah, it's still gross. Um, and sometimes they seem gross. Sometimes they just seem foolish. Okay, I'm here in the middle of all these bones, and I am preaching to them. Uh, we're not told the, all that he might have said, but he at least says... Hear the word of the Lord. Well, there's a little bit more. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Assuming that's it, that's a pretty short sermon. And Ezekiel says, So I prophesied. As I was commanded, this was not God's advice. It was not a suggestion. Mm -hmm. It was not a good thought for the day. It wasn't, well, you're killing time. How about this? He, Ezekiel was commanded to do this thing, to preach to stuff that's dead, that where there's no, to preach where there's no one, because the souls have fled. There's no life. There's no chemical spark. There's, there's nothing except dry rotting calcium, magnesium, whatever else goes, carbon goes into these things. And yet he prophesies. And as he prophesies, something happened. Of course, prophecy, perhaps a good time to define, prophecy mm -hmm. is to speak the word of the Lord by inspiration. Um, and in that respect, it does not differ significantly from preaching as long as the preaching it takes up the word of God and uses it, except it is absolutely inspired and therefore infallible, whereas preachers can make mistakes. But both are taking up the word of the Lord and presenting it to God's people. But but these people are dead. Yeah, well, you know what? Oftentimes preachers are preaching to dead people too, and that's kind of the point here. Not everyone that we bring, to whom we bring the gospel, is spiritually alive. A lot are spiritually dead. A lot have stone hearts and deaf ears are incapable of hearing. And so with these bones. And yet, when he prophesied, he says, as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them. <laughs> and the skin covered them. <laughs> and, but there was no breath in them. Okay, that would make a good science fiction effect <laughs> for some movie sometime. Um, but <laughs> it's like, like, great. Now they're intact corpses. They're intact corpses. Still we're, dead. We're, they're still dead, <laughs> still but we're dead. so much closer, aren't we? <laughs> right. Not, Just uh, like yeah. the moist bones were yeah. better than the dry <laughs> the bones. bones. Yeah. Because isn't, isn't that it? I mean, we, we're almost there. No, no. We're, 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 we're not almost yeah. there. Yeah, this is not, not quite. <laughs> the gulf is still infinite. There is no human device that can turn these 
dead corpses into living people. Not science, not magic, not eloquence, not entertainment, not information, not better clothes and better environment, not a better um, education or more nutrition, more vitamins in their in their food. Improved um, society. Yeah, no, no, yeah, an improved society isn't going to do it. Uh, it there's, there is actually literally nothing that anybody can do unless God intervenes. And so God says something else to him. Ezekiel notes there's no breath in these, in these bodies. And God said, prophesy unto the wind. Now, he, it is the wind he's talking to, but the word for wind, spirit, and breath are the same in Hebrew, rach, uh, as they are the same in, in Greek, pneuma. Um, and so there's a constant play and, and pun on these words throughout Scripture. The Holy Spirit is the breath of God. He's the, the Spirit of God likened to the soul of a man. What, uh, what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so knoweth no things, the things of God, but the Spirit of God. Uh, and, so, and so we go back and forth. Here we're talking about wind, and yet it's more than wind, because wind can't do what this wind is about to do. Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and we're not told here exactly what he said to the wind, probably something like, Come from the four winds, and well, I guess we are told, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain. Notice that we got that they may live. We have sh very short sermons here. Mm -hmm. I think that's something we we should note and probably note again later. It's not the length of the sermon. Yeah. It's not how many mm -hmm. words. It's not how he says it. It's not how he holds his mouth or his countenance or what clothes he has on or what how the spotlights are hitting him or what music is in the background. Um, the words are short. They're to the point. They mean what they say. They're just impossible. In the normal ordering of things, as we are used to God's providence, you can talk to dead bodies and you can talk to the wind all day and nothing's happening until God commands you to do something and intends to use you. And so he says, I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. He said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Uh, and he goes on to compare the rescue, the salvation of his people, not only out of captivity, but out of captivity of sin and darkness and unbelief to what Ezekiel has experienced. We need, we who are dead in sins need resurrection. And the method that God will use is twofold. There are words, there is prophecy, there is preaching, and there is the work of the breath of God, the Spirit of God. There is the sovereign supernatural work of the Spirit which of which we can see the effects, as Jesus tells us. Uh, you can't see the wind, whether it cometh or whether it goeth, but you can see its effects. And here we see the effects. These dead people are alive. And you probably know because, one, they're breathing, and two, they probably start moving around, and they start looking at each other, and they start feeling themselves. And Wait, wasn't I dead a minute ago? Uh, Bob, hey, Bob, what are you doing here? Weren't you dead? I was dead, I think, wasn't I? And they start talking, <laughs> rustling around, moving their feet, you know, all that stuff, that, all the things that living people do because they're alive. But if Ezekiel had gone out there and at the point where they were, they were dead bodies, I mean, he could have picked them up and moved them and grabbed their arms and made their arms go wide and wave and make the mouth move and do a little ventriloquist. Hi, Bob, how are you today? It's, it's not working. This is a supernatural act of God because that's, all, that's the, what's needed and nothing else can accomplish it. Only God can bring life out of death. Only God can bring life out of non-life. Now, we're talking here about a doctrine that is as old as the gospel, as old as, in fact, the world, received renewed attention with Augustine in his writings with, against Pelagius, and re was highlighted most certainly by the Reformation. And the doctrine is called today total depravity, 
or total inability. Uh, and it simply means this, although the although men who walk around and breathe and talk and smile and bat their eyes are physically alive, outside of Christ, they are spiritually and covenantally dead. They do not love God. They have no faith in God. They do not fear God. They do not seek God. There is none that seeketh after God. They're all gone another way. They together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an up and supplicar, and so on. Paul tells us in Romans 3. We're dead in trespasses and sins. We walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. And there is nothing in there. There's nothing to grab onto. There's nothing to appeal to. There's nothing to improve. We have in our whole uh, array of human experience and human accomplishments, nothing that will bring people out of this spiritual death into spiritual life. And we've already talked about some practical things that, that people have tried. Entertainment, love and compassion, cup of Starbucks, smoking lights. Social programs. <laughs> social programs, a better environment, education apologetics based in uh, rational reasoning. If we just ar if we just argue with the corpse, maybe the corpse will come alive. How about if we present... Surely the corpse will see the truth. We'll see, the corpse see that will see it is better to be alive. Yes. And we'll, and we'll thus change, choose. Well, you know, it's the, there, there's the problem. <laughs> there's two problems here. One, the corpse is not perceiving anything, being dead and all. So you can present your arguments and the corpse will not and cannot come to the realization that it is in fact dead, not by itself. You can argue that and there may, you may get some kind of formal nod of, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but dead things don't make spiritual evaluations that are at all reliable. And if they could and did, that still leaves you miles away, well, infinity away, from having that corpse will itself into life. Oh, I perceive that I am death. I am dead. I will now, by an act of my will, an act of my emotions, my conscience, my efforts, something, will myself, make myself alive. Thank you for telling me I'm dead. Now I will choose. I will make myself. The choice has got to go in there. There may be more than choice, but it at least has to be a choice. I will now choose life over death corpses don't do that. When Lazarus was in the grave, nobody went in and argued with him about how mm -hmm. undesirable the state of death was. <laughs> Ezekiel did not argue with these bones. It would have done no good. Now, of course, the ironic thing, perhaps from an unbelievers point of view, and sort of from a Christian point of view, is in theory, preaching to dead bones shouldn't work either. <laughs> right. Because what? <laughs> They can't hear you. <laughs> they can't hear you. They don't listen. They don't believe. They can't receive the Spirit. They can, the rational man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So the very thing that this man needs to come back to life, which is the work of the Spirit of God, comes through the preaching of the gospel, which he refuses to hear because he cannot hear because he's dead in sins. And, and this is the paradox of the gospel and in part why Paul calls it the foolishness of preaching. God chose by the, 1 Corinthians 1, God chose by the foolishness of preaching to save those who are believing. God picks something that doesn't, that should not, from our point of view, in itself, accomplish anything. But when we speak the truth about his son, crucified and risen, God delights to use those words in ways we cannot understand, to bypass the whole, hey, he's dead thing, and to produce life. Mm -hmm. And what he requires of us is to speak those words faithfully. It'd be nice if we spoke them well. It would be <laughs> nice if we spoke them with humility and love and compassion. It would be nice if uh, it wouldn't hurt if we were a little bit entertaining and civil when we spoke. And, and you can make good arguments in your uh, homiletics class for being real and being human and treating the person you're talking to, like a real person, that's all great and fine and part of recognizing the image of God and the person you're talking to. And yet all of that stuff in and of itself does not accomplish anything, nor does it actually add to the power of the simple act of preaching. Mm -hmm. God, God may honor it, 
but it's not in itself something that ignites life. It is the preached message, which is about Jesus, crucified, risen, reigning, coming again, that Jesus, the eternal Son of God, become man. That message has the power to impart supernatural, covenantal, resurrection life. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, dig into this idea of covenant life and death a little more, because I think, as you were saying earlier, throughout scripture, we have the image of sin is death and salvation is life. And sometimes we that comes across as a metaphor in the wrong direction, where salvation, you feel alive um, when, because like to us, life and death is a, is utmost seriousness. You know, we have that phrase, this is a matter of life and death, but to us, death, physical death seems so ultimate and physical life seems taken for granted. So how, how can we better understand life and death as covenantal states? Mm. Um, well, if we go back to <laughs> my favorite chapter in the Bible, nearly. Genesis 1. Three. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eve before the tree is being bombarded with intellectual arguments to push her out of her state of innocence into a state of would-be autonomy. Stand on neutral ground, go fall back on your own neutral reason and make, make a, a choice about God. And sometimes... I think without without thinking about it, I'm not being terribly critical, or I think it's just we need to stop and say, wait, think what you're saying here. We think of, oh, so man died when he ate of the forbidden tree. It depends on what you mean. Dep mm -hmm. We say, well, spiritually, you know, he died spiritually. He, he did not die physically. In fact, that didn't happen then. It didn't happen for another 900 plus years. But I think we need to be careful there because... Eve, and then Adam later, when they turned their backs on God, when they said, oh yes, there's this neutral state where God's not sovereign and God's not Lord, and I don't actually have to listen to God, I, can, I don't have to presuppose his every revelation, I can begin from myself and make my own decisions, I can be a big girl and not listen to authority and be bossed around by this person who claims to be sovereign, God that's boss. when she spiritually died. <laughs> Uh, boss babe. <laughs> boss babe. Yeah, she just, that's where she cut her ties to the life that's in God. Now, then then what? Then she, some people are surprised when I point out, you know, she sinned before she ate the fruit. But no, eating the fruit was the first sin. No, eating the fruit broke the covenant. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. It was the first outward visible sin, yes. But sin begins in the heart. It wasn't that her hand randomly reached up, grabbed this piece of fruit, and shoved it in her mouth, and suddenly she said, whoa, how'd that happen? Oh, look, I'm sinning. She actually thought about this. She made a decision out of her own heart, which she had already alienated from God. She was already in sin. She was already in rebellion, playing out this would-be autonomy. And, but once she was, what she did was inevitable. Without the grace of God to restrain her, without the Holy Spirit rebuking that and somehow turning it back, a thing that wasn't in place yet, she could do exactly what she did do. Without the life of God uh, animating her, guiding her, moving her, she was on her own resources, and those were insufficient. And so she did what she, at that point, would inevitably do. She broke the covenant by taking the sacrament and defiling it. Sacraments among there's many things you can say about sacraments, but one thing about sacraments is they sum up the whole covenant. If you receive the sacrament, you are receiving the covenant, at least formally. And if you reject the sacrament, you are breaking the covenant. Uh, when God ordained circumcision, he said, If the baby is not circumcised and on the eighth day, he has broken my covenant. He is to he's not to be reckoned among the covenant people. And the same thing can apply to baptism in the New Covenant or the Lord's Supper. If you purposely with, um, what is the word, um, abstain from the Supper, week after week, month after month, even year after year, you, you've cut yourself off from the Covenant. That is, all of God's people can look at you and say, uh, sorry friend, you're not a Christian. 
because that's not what the Holy Spirit works in Christians. The Holy Spirit works in Christians submission to the outward forms, particularly these outward forms. Mm -hmm. It's not that the bread and wine are magic no. keeping you in the covenant. No, any more than that original piece of fruit was magic, mm -hmm. but it was a dividing line. You, you step over this line by this one action, um, that, that side is disobedience. That side, that, here's the door out of the covenant. Mm -hmm. And the three, it wasn't that the fruit was bad. The fruit was a chance to grow. You can look at that and say, I won't touch that till God gives it to me. And thus, by denying self, grow in your walk with God. Instead, Adam and Eve broke the covenant law, but they broke it because the sin was already there in their hearts. So they died spiritually. Then they died covenantally. God bans them from the tree of life curses the planet and the universe for their sake, curses them to death, but then comes the promise of salvation in the midst of all that. Now, what that means then, what, what, is it, what, what does that covenantal thing and the spiritual thing mean? Um, spiritual death then means that God has abandoned you to your sins. He has become your enemy. He makes no... Um, promises or commitments besides those general ones that he makes in the gospel. That is, you can't claim, well, but God loves everybody and therefore he's going to save me. No, that's kind of what you just threw away. You just threw away your relationship with God, any kind of good, friendly, profitable relationship. You've made yourself uh, his enemy. You're now at war at God. You're, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God and neither indeed can be. You can't keep God's law. You can't choose Christ. You can't do anything pleasing to God. You, your whole heart and life are dominated by contempt for God, alienation from God. And God in your life and in history will work that out since that's what you've chosen. And in, ultimately, it ends not only in physical death, but probably far more serious. It ends in eternal death in this place called the lake of fire or hell, where... Um, Sorry, God is still there pouring out wrath on you. You are not out of you are not out of God's presence. You're just out of his blessing. And it's not it's not a happy thing. It's not something to joke about. It is a very, very serious thing. And Christians have often been mocked for speaking of hell, but the Bible does, and Jesus spoke about hell more than anyone else in the Bible. It is the final outpouring of God's wrath and judgment against those who hate him and will who will not live in his covenant covenantally, death is, we see that. We see it worked out in our lives. We are not under the authority of the of the um, pastors and elders God has put here. We are not under the preaching of the word. We have no access to the sacraments. We have no claim upon the love and services of the church, although the church may be very gracious to us and give them anyway, depending. And more to the point, the world knows we're not Christians. We're not believers. And it's, the church is not entitled to, uh, to, to, to treat us as such. Jesus said of such, let him be into thee as a heathen man and a publican. Um, Paul said, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, with the hope that the soul may be saved in the day of Jesus Christ. But that's on God's terms and God's time. So when we're talking about death, these, these are the things we're talking about. And they're very serious. And the only way out is the word and spirit of God, which we can sum up with the one word, gospel. This is why we need to be really, really, really clear on what the gospel is um, and not try to adorn it, um, pollute it, substitute something else for it, add to it. Help um, it out. Help it, exactly. Those were exactly the words I was coming up with. <laughs> help it out, yeah. But you see, people don't like the gospel, so I'm going to, yeah, no. Not, you're not going to make it better. You're going to make it worse. There's and, an old line from uh, <clears throat> from King of the Hill, and I've yes. never <laughs> watched more than one episode of this. But um, essentially, he goes to a Christian rock and roll show, oh. and he goes, "You don't understand. You're not making Christianity better. You're just making rock and roll worse." <laughs> <laughs> Classic. And that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Uh, uh, perhaps I will you... reserve my good opinion of certain <laughs> Christian rock and roll outfits. Of course, yes. Exceptions yeah. that prove the rule always. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Um, well, then perhaps you two can come up with with some examples. I'll I'll, I'll give you two. Now, I am a full supporter of the creationist movement, the Young Earth movement, all of that. And some of these ministries, especially, I believe, Ken Ham's, do a great deal of good. But Ken Ham is a presuppositionalist, too. And if you you look at his materials, you say, uh, can can creation science and, and the evidences from it ever lead a man to Christ? He'll say, absolutely not. Don't waste your time even trying that. It's it's these these are things that are helpful for believers and things we can use to silence the opponents, but they don't bring anybody to Christ. But I have seen, <clears throat> particularly in the original generation, a good deal of, well, if we just show them um, this evidence that the Earth is young, or if we find Noah's Ark, or you know, you run through the list of things associated with creation science. And and say this this is what we need. This is what we need to get our church excited about. You know, again, there's not, I'm not saying there's not some good stuff to learn, and some of it's very useful and important to know about. But that's not the gospel. The other example, this was a movement I, against my will, was involved with because <laughs> I had to work for a gentleman who was a leader in the movement. It was I won't name it, but it amounted to an idolization of America's founding fathers. Um, the the people who initiated the movement went back and, and read some of the writings of the Founding Fathers and found in there basic principles <clears throat> of life and government and said, oh, wow, this is what Amer made America great. Let's go and see if we can find them in the Bible. And having, to their satisfaction, found them in the Bible, they began to teach these principles and America's Christian history as a way of reforming the church. What they weren't doing was actually preaching the gospel. Uh, not to say that none of them ever did, but that was certainly not the thrust of the movement. I know I was associated with some of these people for a number of years. Um, I have a feeling I know which group this is, and I will <laughs> ask you afterwards. <laughs> okay. Uh, the gentleman I work with was a complete gentleman, and I, I don't want to say anything bad about him. Um, but... Uh, yeah, there were people in this, one, one lady I remember who said, oh, and so this went on a film that they made, a video they made. Oh, I, I, w I didn't even know Christ until I studied America's Christian history, and then I became a Christian. And I'm thinking, that doesn't sound good. I'm not sure that, what happened there, but that's suspicious at the very least. Which of yeah, the Founding Fathers preached the gospel what, to you? Yeah, we need to talk about what you mean by became a Christian. What yeah. do you mean by Christian and Christ? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this, uh, the video that they had produced was to make was to popularize this movement and i i saw the finished product and it was well done enough that is in technical terms and artistic terms but as i watched it there were only two people in it who explicitly mentioned christ in the gospel mm -hmm. and they were the sons of the children i work for they were also two of my students and they actually spoke of Jesus and the cross. The others talked about Christian principles and character and prov God's providence in America's history, and all, none of which is the gospel. And, and so if you, some of you may know what I'm talking about. If you do, run. <laughs> I don't think it's ever going to become a major movement. I suspect, suspect with time it will, it will die out. Did they do some good things here and there? Yeah, I suppose. But other people had already been doing much of the same thing in in a, in a better co context. I remember one young one lady wanted to put her son in our school and wanted to know, and it was good. She came and asked me what I taught. Very few parents have done that, so I, I commend her greatly for that. But what she did was sit down and say, "Well, now, do you teach the providential view of history?" She's talking to a Calvinist from a Reformed denomination <laughs> that goes back to Germany and the Reformation, and who's been a Bible teacher and had done pulpit supply in said denomination for quite a while. And I tried not to smile. <laughs> and I assured her that I did. And the problem was that her definition of providence was not biblical. The uh, Heidelberg Catechism speaks of God's providence as the everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by his hand he upholds heaven and earth with all creatures, and so governs them that, and then gives a list of all the various things that happen 
and then sums it up. Yea, all things happen not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. In other words, providence is God's constant ordering of every single thing in the universe, mm -hmm. from the smallest subatomic particle to the, to the movement of galaxies, from life to death. Um, and that's not what these people understood by providence. They understood that sometimes God poofs into history and does really nifty things and poofs out again. I know this because, again, I ask the sons of my boss, and they said that's how they describe providence. That's, you know, if their father is a leader, they, they should be good sources on how this is being communicated. And it's so, tricky because a lot of these examples that we can come up with about mistaking what the gospel is or mm -hmm. trying to help out the gospel can be really good things on their own. Like I On think their of, own, yeah. You know, a In their proper quality context. rhetoric of sure. a pastor, right. In their proper context, In their quality proper rhetoric, context. quality music in a worship service. Um, quality light shows. Yeah, I don't necessarily think those belong in a worship quality service. Quality air conditioning quality and heating. Is good. Oh, those <laughs> do belong in a worship service, especially um, in California. Yeah, yeah, I can think also of the, well, you the have classical heating in your school. Place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, heating Cla classical schools. Like, I think as far as an education goes, some of the classical schools are doing a really good job. Are they yeah. giving you a Christian education? Are they giving you? The gospel in all areas of life. Different question. It's a very different question when we will pursue it another time. Yeah. Unless we lose a lot of listeners. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, <we will. laughs> guaranteed. Either way. You no. Know, um, so you you've brought those up. Brian, does anything come to your mind of uh, places where you've seen people try to bring in convicts by things that were not strictly speaking the gospel? Oh, sure. Um I mean, I grew up Pentecostal, so there's any number of examples from that. <laughs> well, but, throw some then. I mean, health, healing, mm. wealth, prosperity from any number of supposed root causes. But out, outside of that, I'd also say there's a lot more recently I've seen where it's like, well, we really need to, we need to focus on making Christianity masculine again to get men involved mm -hmm. in church mm -hmm. and it's it's really not about worshiping the christ that we see in scripture it's about well christ was manly he he did tough guy things he was like john wayne but in palestine um <laughs> it you know that's not that's not the ticket <laughs> no. um again being truthful about who jesus is is good yeah Culture but, war things on both sides, mm, mm -hmm. um, where it's basically, well, Jesus is really the catalyst for this social program that I, I want to do. Jesus would have supported it, so you should support it too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the list goes on. There's just any number of things <laughs> uh, in that same vein. Yeah, you can think of the, the worship wars too, where, you know, oh, yeah. some people will die on the hill of singing hymns in church. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, on, on what basis? How are you judging your hymns? Why mm -hmm. are you throwing out the modern hymns just because they've been written more recently? Mm. Uh, why are you implying that it's sinful to use a guitar rather than a <laughs> piano? That sort of thing. It's like yeah. our, merely, our worship is more pleasing good. to God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I was putting it gently. <laughs> but um, is our worship acceptable to God because we have used the right instruments and we've dressed correctly and our sermon is the right length mm -hmm. or is it by the blood of christ that we yeah. are worshiping and i i come back even to the ideas of love and compassion yes they Fr francis schaefer following the um christ's farewell sermon speaks of love as our final apology they'll know you know the song they'll know we're christians by our love well jesus mm -hmm. actually says something like that mm -hmm. yeah but he does not say that they will come to faith because of that. Right. Yeah. There's a passage in Deuteronomy, I think it's in the Song of Moses. Our rock is not as their rock, mm -hmm. even our enemies themselves being judges. Unbelievers can look at us and say, you guys are weird. There's something different about you. It may even be something we kind of like and kind of are pleasant. That's a far cry from a pinning of their sense and trusting in Jesus. It's a real thing, and God may use it as a springboard for more real things. It may get us a hearing, but when that hearing comes, we better be not talking about, yes, come to us because we'll always love you and accept you. That's not the gospel either. Mm -hmm. 
Um, mm. As though our love and acceptance is so great a thing. Yeah. (laughs) Jesus' love and acceptance is a lot bigger of a deal. Yeah, and it it comes on his terms, which Mm -hmm. involves this cross thing. And even more so, it comes with his power to meet his standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think we we should not leave this without mentioning um, something else that's not the gospel, and that's, (laughs) or at least often is not presented in a way that you could call it the gospel. That's the so-called five points of Calvinism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, let's, so you are totally depraved and capable of believing. God may or may not have predestined you to eternal life. Jesus may or may not have died for you. But if he did, he will be sending you the Holy Spirit to convict you of your sins. And once you come to Christ, he will never let go of you. Whether you like it or not. Yeah, it, it's possible that someone <laughs> could find the gospel in there if God is gracious. But it, it's, it's a stretch. Yep. Now, the thing is, the, that's it's more a description of the mechanics of the gospel. Yes, it is. <laughs> it, it's exactly what it's, it is. It's the it's, difference between my car went from El Paso to Austin, Texas, and, you know, here's how fuel is converted into energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. Yeah. Let's, Walking let's, up to people and yeah. saying, let me tell you about Jesus is still what God would have us do. You can do it from the pulpit if you're ordained to the office. You should do it in truth. You should do it reverently. You, you want to, because what you say should be influenced by how you say what you, how you're saying it should, and, and the way you're saying it, the context you're saying it, should be influenced by what you're saying, or you get kind of a odd disconnect. Mm-hmm. And yet in the end, it is the words, the truth the word represents that the eternal Son of God became man and died in the place of sinners, to substitutionary atonement, and that by his resurrection life, we can be forgiven, we can have new lives, we can be born again, we can go to heaven and be with Jesus forever. We can be, we will be raised from the dead and enjoy a new heaven and new earth. It doesn't take that long. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet sometimes we hesitate, especially those of us who are Calvinists, we hesitate because, well, there's so much theology that needs to go in there, so much worldview. You know, that's for discipling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At, at, at the moment when you have three minutes, three minutes and the bus is coming, that's not a time to despair and say, well, I obviously can't say anything because they're, they're... <laughs> This is where with uh, Inigo Montoya, we say, uh, there is, there too, is much. too much. <laughs> Let me sum up. <laughs> Let me sum up. And you can sum up pretty much the way I just did. Yeah. Uh, Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. He did a quick summary. And then spent another hour or two later on, but it was enough to start the process. When uh, Peter's audience said, men and brother, what shall we do? He said, uh, repent every one of you and be baptized for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the promises to you and to your children are all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. Now, true, that audience already knew a good deal about the gospel, uh, about biblical theology and historical theology. And yet, what Peter had to say, even, even his sermon, is not that long. Mm-hmm. It didn't take a couple hours. He could get to his point pretty fast, and so can we. We just need, what we need is boldness. Mm-hmm. Love for the lost, concern for soul made in the image of God, who may be bound for hell if we don't say something. And um, too often, I think Calvinists of all various stripes have fallen back. We've been accused of this, and we say, no, 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 no. And yet, mm-hmm. well, they're predestined. If God's going to save them, it he doesn't need me. It'll happen. Yeah. You don't do that with anything else in life. Well, if I'm going to eat, God will God will provide. Huh? I mean, it's predestined, right? He I don't predestined need a job. that I don't you need would money. go to the grocery store <laughs> yeah. and cook the shop. food. Yeah, I don't put do the any chicken of that. in the crock pot. <laughs> and in a sense, that brings us back to the the dry bones in Ezekiel, which is God has ordained means for how mm-hmm. the dry bones put on flesh and are filled with breath. <laughs> It's the preaching of the word of -hmm. the Lord, which is the work of Christ. Yeah. Preaching Jesus. Super. Uh, That's all the time we have. So let's do some recommendations and run off. I'm going to recommend putting a whole chicken in a crock pot. (laughs) I was afraid to. And like David and I have been on this kick of like, let's eat as many whole 
pieces of food as we can figure <laughs> out. So I bought a whole chicken and I was like, I've never cooked a whole chicken before. I don't know how this works. So I did the magic Googling and just put the chicken in the crock pot on top of some potatoes. And it was great. That's awesome. <laughs> we we did, um, we've been doing similar where um, my Emily will take a whole chicken. We have an instant pot. So it's like mm -hmm. an afternoon deal for her, but she'll cook the whole chicken in the instant pot, debone it, uh, put the bones in with some vegetable scraps and stuff, and then make a broth in the same mm. thing. Yeah, yeah. we're going to do that. Like we, two have, hours. we saved the bones. Yep. Oh, it's, it's a game changer, like for real. We make mm. so much soup with it. It's great. <laughs> um, and then uh, she also borrowed her mom's Nesco, which if you're not from the Midwest, is like a crock pot on steroids. It's like a little convection <laughs> oven that goes on <laughs> your countertop. And she put a whole like 23 pound turkey in there <laughs> and it, she didn't, she didn't put salt or pepper or anything on it. It came out perfect and <laughs> delicious. So, um, it's, it's just cooking whole birds is the way that it should be done. I'm convinced at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to, I guess, I guess this is our recommendation from all of us. I'm going to go for an older fashioned way of cooking whole birds. That's in the oven. Oh yes, and you you kind of slit the skin and you slide some pats of butter underneath it. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, first of all, you've pulled out all the things that aren't supposed to stay in there. And sometimes they actually come in little packages of liver, oh, the and, giblets and stuff. Yeah, you know, all the yeah. giblets. You can get that out. Some people don't know that that has to come out. It comes. Out. <laughs> and then you cut up you cut up mushrooms and onions and celery and garlic and and you can do breadcrumbs and you shove it all inside that cavity. Mm. And then you, that was you, the weirdest part. I'm going to be real about handling some the the former bird you know it's not just <laughs> meat from the grocery store anymore it's like this this was a living bird and there yeah. were its ribs <laughs> it's a little weird i'm i'm not a gonna little, lie it's a little um disconcerting at first yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like i've, you, I've pulled stuff helps, out and people have looked at me and said what is that <laughs> yeah. okay, if it helps you do get more used to it the more yeah. you do it just I'm, you know, it's, I'm it's exposure so. therapy yeah I basically guess. It's like, I because I, I have the same issue. We we did a, a duck last Christmas, mm. and it had all of its guts inside, and we're like, oh wow, that's just disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, and then you put it in your your big. I don't even know what you Dutch call oven? them. Roasting no, pan. It's just a, a a big pan. Ours is is like ceramic. I don't know. Oh yeah, it's a roasting dish. pan. A roasting dish. Yeah, yeah, you put it in a roasting dish. Salt and pepper all over the place. And then you pour, at least I do, you pour, and this is a great place to use your chicken broth that you were talking about, if you already have some saved, um, or you can buy a can. And you pour that around. And you also, whatever vegetables didn't go in the bird, go around the bird, along with some potatoes, and get more salt and pepper and everything. And then you just cook it. Yep. And then every now and then you reach in and kind of pull the tray out. You take some of all of that wonderful, what do you call the stuff? I just blanked. Uh, juices. Juice. Okay. You take some <laughs> of you, the wonderful juices that are all around it and you just kind of um, lace it over. There's a word again. My Based. vocabulary has vanished. Base. With the, yeah, with yeah. the uh, bulby thing. Yeah, the bulby the thing. If you have a bulby thing, that's great. I just generally <laughs> use a spoon or a ladle actually because we our bulby things keep getting broken. Uh, and and you you just let it cook, um, and it, it takes a while, but it's wonderful. And oh, yeah. people come and say, "You made this?" And, yeah, it's not that hard actually, <laughs> but boy, does it taste good! And it will it will last a few days, depending on how many people there are in your family. But yeah, the the, the cooking of one big thing. There's much to be said for this. We yes. can make side dishes if you want. There there is a reason that. Uh, a Christmas Carol ends with buying yeah. the big bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Martha, that's such a goose. <laughs> yes, there is a delightful Twice boy. I love to talk Tim. to him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I think well, those are thank our recommendations. You guys so much for this conversation. <laughs> thank you. Excellent recommendations all around. Thank you also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. 
Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. If you'd like to get in touch with us for any reason, you can send us an email at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. And we hope you'll join us again next week. Thanks for listening.